Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erin Page, and I'm the Senior Law Librarian and Staff with FASCA Legal Research. With me today is my colleague, Morgan Wright. Morgan, would you like to introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Morgan. I am the publisher of Full Court Press, which is uh, Fast Cases publishing imprint, which recently published Mr. Fornius's book on mediation. Fantastic. So I'm going to go ahead and take care of a couple of quick housekeeping announcements, and then we will introduce today's guest speaker. The first housekeeping announcement. You may have noticed that you're currently in listen-only mode. This is to cut down on some of the background noise, which is a little easier to hear us. However, you are welcome to ask questions at any point during today's presentation. On the screen, you should have the go to webinar pop up. And on that pop up, you can see a button that's labeled question. Click on that if there are any questions you might have for us. Our second announcement today's session is not for CLE credit. We do have CLE webinars that are available through Fast Case. Those are on Thursday afternoons at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. All right. So with those out of the way, uh, let's meet our guest speaker for today. Mr. Vincent Fornius is the author of Now You See Them, Now You Don't, The Magic of Mediating. He is a fantastic mediator and presenter, and we are very fortunate to have us join us today. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us, Mr. Fornius. Um, we're going to get right into the book discussion. Um, so right off the bat in the opening chapter of your book, you explain how important experience is, how important reputation is, how these are really key factors and often even barriers to entry for getting into mediation. Um, to becoming a mediator. So how can an aspiring mediator best build their skills and prepare themselves um, through other aspects of their career? Well, you know, actually, I have found that that it begins really your first day as a lawyer, uh, whether you're ever planning to become a mediator or not. Uh, from that point on, you're developing uh, a reputation. Uh, it's, it's not that big of a world no matter where you are and uh, you know your work ethic has to shine through uh, uh, your sense of, of fair play um, your sense of fairness your credibility with your with your cohorts um, and and really just kind of your collegiality uh, most of my career was in was in litigation and, you know, uh, you can still be collegial and do a very good job in representing your client. Um, so um, it, it, it's really not uh, a lot like, uh, again, we can talk, we're probably going to talk a lot about cartoons and how I've used that in mediations. It's not like the classic, you know, Peanuts cartoon where all of a sudden, you know, Lucy hangs up the shingle that in her case, the, the therapist is in, you don't just hang up the, the shingle that the mediator is in, you kind of build to that, you kind of build to a crescendo over your career where people will trust you and feel like you will do a good job. And uh, uh, that, that's kind of how I find that it has worked. I've been very fortunate that it worked as well as it did for me. Absolutely. Some of the best experience I uh, or best advice I was given in law school was your re reputation is everything and do everything you can to protect your reputation. Um, speaking more to those those young attorneys that want to get into mediation, is there really a path forward for them besides just practicing law and practicing law well? Or uh, did they kind of have to happen into it? How did you yourself first get involved with mediation? Yeah. And, and again, it's. Uh... I actually, and I mentioned this in the book, I actually got into it by accident. I had, I had mediated uh, as an advocate uh, hundreds of cases and one day, and this is probably goodness in the, in the eighties, um, which seems like ancient history, which it is, uh, a client of mine, an insurance client of mine said, look, the mediator that we were using uh, in a couple of days uh, got an emergency. Uh, if I call the opposition and mention you as a potential mediator, are you willing to give that a shot? And uh, I had never thought about doing that, 
Um, I said, sure, what the heck? And we went in. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, we had a good time, though. And uh, at the end of the day, the case did not settle, but I got hooked. Uh, it was it was a process that very much intrigued me and uh, uh, it kind of built up from there. I got some training, which you really do need to get some training. Uh, there is uh, some science to this, although I think it's mostly an art. And uh, gosh, almost 4,000 mediations later, uh, here I am. I've been very, again, very fortunate. Well, speaking of fortune or bad fortune, depending, so there's, you've mentioned in your book several situations that you recommend for mediation. Are there any areas of law where you do not recommend mediation or which you find difficult to mediate and why? Um, if, if you're going to do this at all as a full-time or semi-full-time occupation, um, you're going to, at least in the present day, you're going to have to do mostly uh, personal injury, casualty, uh, uh, products liability, insurance type of, of mediations. That by far, at least I found, is where the volume of the work is. That doesn't mean, however, that there are cases that uh, have nothing to do with that, that you will find yourself mediating. I never called myself a family lawyer and I mediated a few family law cases. Uh, the longest case I ever mediated was in an area that I had no experience in whatsoever. It was an intellectual property case. Uh, and again, the, the limitations, I, I really find no area of the law to answer your question uh, that I find should not be mediated. But as a mediator, your own personal limitations are, you know, there are certain areas that you have no background or expertise in, subject matter areas, that maybe you won't be able to know which buttons to push uh, to kind of explore the gray areas that lead to a consensus. Uh, but, you know, per se to say, no, don't ever mediate an environmental case or don't ever mediate, you know, class actions or intellectual property, I, I, I don't think that, that that would be an accurate answer. Uh, I think the process is probably more important than the particular subject matter area. Excellent. So, Aaron, and, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Aaron. No worries. We do have an audience question, and I think it's a great one. So, let's go ahead and throw that one in. The audience asks What factors should participants consider in deciding the optimal time when a case is ready for mediation? I'm sorry, I did not understand. The, the first part of the question didn't come through. Sure. What factors should participants in a mediation or who will be participants in mediation consider in deciding the optimal time when the case is ready for mediation? Not to punt, but it varies. Um, I've, I've had cases where um, uh, we've had mediations pre-suit. Um, I, I find that those are exceptional situations. I think in order to have an optimal chance of settling a case at mediation, you need to have at least some basic discovery done. Uh, you need to propound interrogatories, request for production, uh, maybe request for admissions, and take some basic, basic depositions of, of the case. I don't think you need to do full-fledged discovery because that almost defeats one of the great uh, benefits of a mediation, which is to cut costs, litigation costs. Um, I, I, I really uh, don't like when people say, oh, it's, it's going to be, it's going to do no good and you have no chance of settling a case if you mediate it, uh, on, on, if, 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 you, if you don't mediate it the week before trial. Uh, a lot of cases do get mediated the week before trial, but you don't have to do that. I think you can just get an intelligent uh, understanding of what the issues in the case are uh, and mediate at that point. In the um, opening chapters of your book, you speak a lot about communication and observational skills during communication and how important those are as part of negotiations. Um, in your opinion, how has the current remote situation we're living through as a result of COVID-19 changed mediation either for the better or for the worse? 
you know, I always like to have an optimistic output. And, and I will say this, um, I am now basically only arbitrating and doing other kind of uh, magisterial uh, early neutral evaluation types of things. My last mediation was pre-COVID by choice. I decided I wanted to move on to other areas. Uh, I did handle online, a few online mediations pre-COVID. And as a general rule, I mean, I find that, and I talk about this in the book, um, if, if over 50% of communication is basically a nonverbal communication, it's hard for a mediator to get that feel to get down and dirty with the parties and with the lawyers um, over Zoom mediations. Uh, it's just too easy for people not to get invested in the process. Uh, it's very, very difficult for a mediator to see body language, for example, and other very important factors that kind of give you an insight into where this is going in the different rooms. I say all that, however, and I certainly understand that in the age of COVID, uh, we have no choice but to do this. Uh, I also understand, or little choice, I also understand uh, that um, there are um, bureaucracies out there that, but for uh, doing uh, online mediations after COVID, would never have explored the possibility of mediating at all. So it introduces some people to the process, even though it's a tip of the iceberg uh, introduction, that otherwise would not be introduced to the process. But in general, I think, uh, and, and I've used this analogy, I believe, in the book, a comedian the, the, the worst nightmare for a comedian is to be have a, a significant distance away from his audience. That comedian wants to be as close to the audience as possible. For a mediator, which often who often has to be a comedian, uh, it's it's kind of the same thing. Uh, uh, in a remote setting, it, it's just really hard to be in tune and in touch and have the rhythm that that you do uh, in in live settings. And I hope that answers your question. And I know there are people that disagree with me, but I, I hope that answers your question in terms of my opinion. I think it does. Um, in, in any respect, is, has the process become more efficient? Are, are things scheduled faster or anything like that? Or is it mostly uh, the same or, or slower? Well, from what I understand, you know, you, you're able to schedule things faster because you don't have travel, you know, delays. Uh, uh, and, 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 you know, logistical matters such as that. But I think what you lose in not having what I refer to as, you know, the wizards of Oz in both rooms or in however many rooms, the decision makers there live and in color, it, it kind of damages uh, the, 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 the commitment that, that uh, you're able to get when somebody's there live and in color as opposed to, um, I'm out, um, online. Excellent observation. So, oh, and by the way, I do have I do have one prop to answer that question. You also don't want, uh, you know, this to happen like happened to the poor guy that's gone viral on the internet who, whose filter made him into a cat um, during, uh, you know, during a status conference with the judge. You can you avoid that live and in color. Uh, as well. I am not a cat. I am a mediator. <laughs> I love it. Very on topic. Um, so what are some of the biggest mistakes that new mediators have? So you just mentioned the mistake that happened with the attorney, but are there any mistakes that new mediators specifically make? So, for example, you mentioned that some mediators see themselves as a messenger from room to room without much intervention or strategy on their part. What are some of the other mistakes that a new mediator sometimes makes? Um, I, I think there are several categories of mistakes that I have seen. And, and again, in my career, I've been asked to, to kind of mentor and, and, um, and, and walk through the process with aspiring mediators. One big mistake I see is impatience. Uh, a lot of mediators want to 
cut to the chase a little too soon in a mediation. And you really can't do that. You have to let the process uh, kind of work. You need to let the soup simmer at, 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 as it may. Um, I talk about the, the three V's in, in a mediation, uh, uh, letting the parties vent uh, and uh, uh, allowing themselves as the process goes to validate themselves and for you to validate them. And only then do you have a chance of the parties feeling vindicated, like they have been heard. Uh, if you get too proactive and if you, if you just want to trade numbers and say, this is where I think it's going, uh, the parties are not going to feel like they have been heard and, and like they have done their best negotiation. Uh, gotten to, uh, I think, in, in one of the, the great authors of, of negotiation in getting to yes, the author refers to it as the baton of the, the uh, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. You can't do that too soon in a, in a negotiation. You have to kind of go through it. That's one issue. Um, Another issue is, and I learned this the hard way, even with whatever training I got, maybe I was naive, but in a lot, in most mediations, and I'll tactfully, and um, I'll refer to it as puffing, okay? Some are outright lies. And you find that some mediators that don't have very much experience uh, take the parties or the lawyers at their word and some of the things that are being said and find those as absolute walls that can't be scaled. And, um, you know, in, in, in any particular mediation, you can have multi puffing taking place. You can have the lawyer puffing to his own client, the client puffing to his own lawyer, the same thing in the other room going on and everybody puffing to the mediator. And the mediator has to realize that that is going on and that that's part of the process and that you have to kind of get through that. Um, excuse my French. In, in my book, I, kind of, I refer to it as, as uh, letting the, the running of the bullshit take place as opposed to the running of the bulls. And, uh, you know, you, you have to get through that in order to, to really get to, uh, to, to levels and situations where you have a chance to settle a case. Those are two big mistakes. Circling back to something you just mentioned, since we have an audience question on it, uh, what or how important is it that the party have a BATNA? And uh, also, if you wouldn't mind defining BATNA for anybody who might not be familiar. Yeah, the, the, the BATNA, and again, it comes from the, the, the book written by Fisher and Yuri. Um, it, it's it's the the acronym is best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Essentially, um, you know the the party in a mediation or in a negotiation, you know, wants to know that some way somehow uh, he's going to do better with whatever is on the table or has a very good chance of doing better on the table uh, the majority of the time than if he were not negotiating, or than if he were going to trial. And uh, it, it, it's kind of your best case scenario, so to speak, uh, as opposed to rolling the dice in a courtroom. Shifting gears a little bit, um, so much of your book is focused on the mediator's personality, their disposition, um, the level-headedness they exhibit, humor, and a good attitude. These are all part of the mediator's toolbox. Can you give some examples from your own career when these soft skills have really made a big difference in your negotiations? Yeah, I, I, I can think of, of gosh, uh, a lot of examples. Uh, and, and again, every, every mediation is different. You can't say, okay, in, in advance of the mediation, well, I'm gonna try this or that. It really depends on, on what's going on in that particular mediation. I do use humor a lot. I refer to it in the book as S&M, uh, my own S&M, sarcasm and mockery. And uh, for example, uh, somebody may, uh, in, in the venting stage, uh, refer to somebody as, and again, to keep it semi-clean, you know, a butthole in the other room. And I might just sarcastically ask before I leave that room, 
let's see, butthole, is that hyphenated or not? Just to kind of tactfully point out the absurdity of of taking that position and 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 expecting me to do that. Related matter, I, I, in, in many occasions, I found myself, you know, somebody made a declaration, an absurd declaration in a room, and rather than saying that's an absurd declaration, because you don't want them back on their heels, uh, you know, I'll do something like, okay, let me write that sentence down and make sure that I've got it right so that um, I can repeat what you just said to the other room and they'll get the message. You know, they'll laugh nervously and and uh, and let me do what I need to do in the other room with those situations. That's one situation. Um, another one. Uh, I don't think I, I talked about this one in the book. And again, it it goes back to having battle scars of not being able to just leave law school and mediate. I'm, I may talk about a war story or two to emphasize the uncertainties of what can happen in a courtroom. Had a situation where somebody was walking across a grain silo, and this is not as unsafe as it might seem. It is a safe situation unless somebody at the bottom of the silo pulls a lever, in which case that person gets sucked in. That's what happened in that in that case. Person spent the eight longest minutes of his quickly diminishing life in the middle of grain uh, before he was pulled out and he had permanent brain damage. Um, we tried that case to a conclusion. Uh, he had a wife, several children, was making very good money. At the end of the day, a jury of 12 strangers decided that all of it was the employer's fault and that uh, the manufacturer of the grain silo in terms of failure to warn or manufacturing issues had no responsibility in that case. Uh, do I consider that justice? No. But again, justice many times doesn't prevail in a, in, in a mediation. And I make that point with personal war stories like that. Um, another situation. Um, in terms of trying to be as creative as possible to meet the needs of the case. Uh, and I think I mentioned this in the book. In fact, I know I do. We had a wrongful death case involving a, a, a young man, a teenager, um, who was struck by uh, a garbage truck and killed. He was a, 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 a football star in a local high school. Uh, we've got the parents there, and you can imagine how they're feeling, uh, not just obviously when the accident happened, but throughout the mediation. And uh, toward the end of the mediation, after eight, nine, ten hours, the representative for the garbage company, the waste disposal company, got impatient. He had flown in from Lord knows where and said, that's it. You know, they're at a point now where they're getting greedy. Uh, we were about a hundred thousand dollars apart, by the way, at that point, at a seven-figure settlement, and uh, and and, and I, I floated a, a, a potential to to that person without having checked with the parents in the other room. I said, "Look, I don't know whether this will work or not, but sometimes it's really not about the money that they take home with them. What if I go in there and hypothetically?" I'm not going to commit you to it, but I need to know in this room right now that you'd agree to it if they agree to it. What if hypothetically uh, they would agree to a scholarship at his high school, uh, the, the uh, uh, sportsmanship award, funding that through maybe a $50,000 endowment, which would be tax free to you. It wouldn't go into the parent's pocket. Let me do that, and maybe we can split this baby on that basis. You get a tax deduction, and perhaps they feel vindicated. You know, the 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 uh, uh, representative said, "Oh, that's not going to work. Feel free to do it as long as it's hypothetical." But all they care about is, and I wish I had a nickel for every time I heard this phrase, the greenback poultice. Um, I go into the other room and hypothetically discuss that with the parents. And there were tears in their eyes, tears got in my eyes. You know, the mother said, that's all we ever wanted was that his life uh, 
was not spent in vain. And if you can get that endowment and that scholarship, uh, we certainly uh, uh, would, would agree to settle the case. And that's how that case settled. Uh, it was a matter of principle, you know, LE rather than principle AL at the end of the day. And again, you, you have to kind of summon those issues, those creative juices uh, in, in order to uh, maximize your chance of settling cases when, uh, when it's not just about the money. Excellent. So humor features prominently in your book, and you also mentioned using comics or cartoons to ease the mood or to set a tone or to respond to something that someone has said. How do you find the comics that you use? Are these personal favorites? Do you seek out particular topics? I can tell you that, um, gosh, I've always liked cartoons. I'm not a cartoonist, uh, but, you know, I always liked, uh, I, I thought the greatest genius of cartoonists that ever lived until he retired, unfortunately, was Gary Larson of the Far Side uh, cartoons. He had such a sense of the absurd and black humor that I, that I happen to be a big fan of. Uh, that, that I really enjoyed him. And so when I started mediating, I started, and, and hopefully the statute of limitations is, is done for using this and copying these cartoons. I started just, you know, reading the papers and copying some, uh, reading, you know, New Yorkers, uh, copying some of those. Uh, Hager the Horrible was a, a, a good subject matter. Dilbert was always good. And I would not only just copy the cartoon, I'd put a caption on top of, of each cartoon that would maybe send the message uh, that I would want to send. Uh, sarcastic messages, reality messages, uh, and, and people seem to enjoy it. So it got to the point where uh, some of my better clients would actually, you know, send me cartoons. You may want to try this one the next time you're, you're mediating. I had one lawyer that used me a lot, you know, who showed up at my office one day with this, you know, three volume set of every cartoon that Gary Larson ever did. And I had to tell him, I can't accept that. I appreciate it. I'm very flattered. Um, if you let me pay for them, then I'll, I can do that. But I, I really can't accept your very generous gift. Um, and um, I had one situation, it's the only time that I recall ever it happening, where I'm doling out cartoons. And again, you have to use your timing properly. Uh, but even in death cases, people will want a little bit of comic relief. Uh, um, but I had one situation where I did not know this, but the injured party in that case was also a cartoonist. And she started drawing cartoons for me and saying, send this to the other room and you know basically I would well, hang on I am the trained professional here you can't draw the cartoons I'm going to use but we all had a laugh and uh, and, and at the end of the day it, it settled um, so again it's it's just I, I kind of got known for that shtick and uh, it, it helps diffuse situations and it helps cut the tension and and people kind of started looking forward to it made matters a little bit more fun. Has it ever backfired on you? Um, you know, I, I, I've got to say that like with a comedian, you know, sometimes um, you think that a particular joke will work in a particular circ circumstance and you fall flat on your face. Uh, thankfully, that hasn't happened very often. And by the way, I don't go out of my way before remediation to handpick which cartoons I will bring. Uh, I had, you know, I had hundreds of cartoons and I would just, I would just, you know, pick out 20 or 30 that I thought would work that day and bring them with me and then just kind of potluck, see what I had and then use uh, whatever I had at a time where I thought it would be optimal to use that cartoon. I'd even sometimes, you know, tell one room, um, although all this is confidential, wait till you see the cartoon I'm going to use in the other room. And boy, they'd be real curious to see what I was going to use in the other room. Because, 
you know, I tell them it's malpractice to use the same cartoons in both rooms. You know, you're always getting a different cartoon depending on the situation. Speaking a little bit about um, your process and preparing for a negotiation, what are the most important goals that a mediator should keep in mind early when they're starting a negotiation? And how can a skilled mediator really set the stage for success early on in the mediation? The most important thing is, I mean, you, you, it's, it's rare where you're going to have, you know, the opening salvos in a mediation make huge productive process. It happens, but it doesn't happen very often. And the main thing is you got to get that plane off the tarmac before you can get into a cruising altitude where people, you know, are really uh, reasonably uh, uh, making uh, uh, progress uh, toward landing into, into settlement land. Um, in order to do that, you know, there are techniques that you use. You know, if, uh, if, if, if you have situations uh, from the beginning, uh, and, and I don't know if I mentioned this in the book, where, um, you know, somebody two weeks before uh, the mediation had made a settlement demand uh, to the other side, and then at the mediation, the first demand is twice what the settlement demand was two weeks before. And, you know, nothing significant had happened in that two weeks. It's hard to get that plane off the ground when that happens. And you have to get, you know, into very early fire control mode in that situation. Uh, and, and that is in, in that situation, I was able to convince uh, that uh, plaintiff's lawyer that it wasn't going to help him at all to do that. And that if he started at a different number, even though his wiggle room, you know, would be less, if he started at even a slightly lower number than where he was two weeks before or even at that number, that I could get significant rewards from the other room. Uh, he tried to justify it, by the way, by saying, well, you know, that that mediate that settlement demand two weeks ago was a settlement demand. And this one that is twice the amount is a mediation demand. Well, you know, again, you in Black's Law Dictionary, there's no difference between a settlement demand and a mediation demand. Um, um, so, I, I, again, you have to avoid early impasses. Uh, and and that's, that's a very, very important uh, uh, aspect uh, with, with regard to uh, uh, early caucuses. You also need to inculcate, you need to, to foster a communal spirit uh, uh, from the beginning. And that's not a, a political statement. Uh, it, it's, it's a statement where we're all working on this together. And it starts even with the opening session and with, you know, what my opening spiel would be. You know, we may not agree on a lot of things going in, but we all agree that we're going to listen to what everybody has to say and we're going to work hard through this process. I might even infuse some humor at, 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 at that point. Um, with, such as uh, nobody uh, expects anybody to take the first offer. In fact, you have to pace yourselves because I've heard the menu is very good today. And you may even get homemade cookies if you get into the afternoon. Um, just, just to keep them invested, just to keep them going, wear them out where they're both uh, in the same solar system rather than in different ones, which sometimes happens early on in the mediation. So we have an audience question, and that question is, how should a mediator address an attorney or a party who is an idealist, someone who will not consider negotiating on a particular point because it's the principle of the issue? Yeah, that's a very good question, and, and that happens. Uh, 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 and, and, and the one way that I address that was to use examples. I'd like to think that that I have a little bit of an idealist in me as well. I think hopefully most of us have a little bit of, of an idealist in themselves. And, you know, what I would try to do is, number one, I would respect their ideals because I do and did. Uh, but I would also show what could happen with ideals in a courtroom based upon things that had happened to me or that had happened to other cohorts, such as 
uh, you know, the, the, the person in the grain silo, such as another example that happened to me, a nice blue haired little old lady who during uh, Christmas time was in a shopping mall and slipped and fell on something that had been spilled in the mall and she became a quadriplegic as a result. Uh, and before trial, uh, and it was her decision, she turned down uh, major seven figure money, tried the case, and at the end of the day, ideals or not, because she did not think that it was right, did not think it was right to, to, to take that small of a sum of money, that jury looked her in the face and said, it was all your fault for not watching where you were going. That matter got appealed, went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and that poor lady uh, ended up getting zeroed out. Um, so uh, again, that's where having the battle scars of what has actually happened in courtrooms um, uh, uh, help uh, uh, deal with and convince and persuade idealists that it's not worth rolling the dice uh, for your ideals, that you have to make a practical, pragmatic decision that day as much as I respect their ideals. And you can't do that, by the way. You, you have to garner their trust. You can't do that early on in a mediation. Um, and sometimes in a mediation, uh, with idealists or not, I'll, I, I will t turn to somebody and I, and, I'm, and I will mean it sincerely and say, look, whether this case settles or not, you've done everything that I've asked you to do today. And, um, and, and whether it matters or not, you have my respect and thank you for working hard with me. Um, and and um, then we, we keep working at it until hopefully the case settles. So we've talked a little bit about the early stages of a negotiation. Um, what are your tried and true closing techniques for when it seems like the well of negotiation is running dry and neither party is willing to move? Um, what, what do you, where do you go from there? Well, again, there isn't one tried and true technique. Um, hopefully every good mediator has a whole toolbox, uh, depending on what has happened uh, uh, during a mediation. I emphasize this in the book, you really, really have to listen. Listen like you've never listened before to kind of read what's between the lines. Listen with three ears, uh, uh, not only to what's being said, but how it's being said and what's not being said. And, and then call upon that toward the end of the mediation uh, where you can apply that, where you can apply the needs, where you can apply uh, uh, where you believe this case might settle. Uh, and you can't do that early on. Um, one thing that, that, uh, that, uh, that I analogize to, if we've gone, you know, five, six, seven, eight hours, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll analogize to a marathon. You know, we've been running this marathon. We're at the 25th mile now. and don't give up, you know, let this matter proceed through the finish line. Um, we might do some floats toward the end of the day. Um, and, and by floating, and I think I, I explained that in the book, it's what if situations, hypothetical situations. Um, again, you don't want to expose anybody in any of the rooms you're working in because everything is confidential. But, you know, if I can get you an extra blank in the other room, I got to know that you would accept that number. I'm not saying that I can, but if I can, um, again, calling on my cartoons, you cannot be, again, Lucy and Peanuts. You can't put that football down there uh, and let me go in the other room and have Charlie Brown try to kick it and then yank the football away. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to take one cent less than the number that I am talking about now, but by golly, um, if I get that number, you can't back out on me. Um, and, 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 you know, that floats work very well uh, toward the end of the process. Another good technique to use is um, by toward the end, you know, the numbers are close enough where you can actually do a little bit of math. 
and go into one room or the other and say, look, the number where they're at right now, once you factor in, say in the defense room, once you factor in defense costs, legal interest, which you get after, you know, you would pay after judgment uh, and, and, and uh, uh, expert witness costs, you're really netting out better in your settlement right now than you would if you go to trial. Uh, in the plaintiff's room, um, I, I like to use what's called the, the, the TREE acronym, T-R-E-E, -E, time, risk, expense, and emotions. And I, and I talk about toward the end of a, of a mediation, look what this would say to you. You don't have to relive this again in a courtroom full of strangers in front of 12 jurors, 11 of whom are in a bad mood because they didn't know anybody to get them out of jury duty. Um, you don't want to roll the dice. You don't want to put this difference between what you want and what I can get for you onto a roulette wheel uh, and, and lose it all. Uh, look at the expenses. Look at your expert witnesses you're going to have. And look at appeals. Uh, I know in some of the cases that I mediated, you're looking at two, three years at the court of appeal, even after you get to trial. Is it worth that delay uh, to not settle the case right now? Is this bird in the hand not worth a lot more than two in the bush? Uh, so those are just a few of the techniques, but there's, gosh, there's countless of them depending on the case. Excellent. So speaking of some other practical matters, what do you know now that you wish you knew when you first set up your mediation practice? What are the benefits of joining a panel versus going solo? Things like that. Well, in terms of knowing now, uh, I tell you, I before I mediated my first case, I had litigated probably, oh gosh, 20 to 22 years. And I knew lawyers had egos, but I just didn't know how large of egos certain lawyers had. I could mediate a case and not see that lawyer for five, six years. And a thousand mediations later, that lawyer would come to me and say, by the way, on the, you know, Rabinowitz case, um, and I'm supposed to remember every fact of the Rabinowitz case that occurred 10 years before because it was their case. And so I, I, I did kind of my best. I learned the hard way to, to uh, keep notes on, on some matters um, such that if it were mentioned, um, I'd have some familiarity with, with those cases, although it's impossible to remember every case. Um, um, in terms of solo practice, oh, and another thing that I learned, which I mentioned already before, was all the puffing that goes on in mediations, that, that you really have to uh, uh, take a lot of that into consideration and, and not uh, as etched in stone uh, needs or demands that will get a case settled. You got to get beyond that. In terms of solo versus going with a group, I kind of did both. Um, I soloed through my law firm for uh, uh, several years, and that that involved, you know, setting up the mediations and having enough conference rooms, feeding these people, collecting mediation fees, et cetera. And I found that it just wasn't worth the extra nickel that you made. You know, you'd make 100 percent of whatever you charge because because it was your own solo practice. Um, a group, I think, it, at least in my experience, gives you a lot more flexibility. Uh, it, it gives you the collegiality and uh, kind of a learning experience of bouncing things off cohorts. Um, in terms of how to deal in a particular situation. Um, it, it also gives you the infrastructure uh, that you need to mediate. It, it provides you with the conference rooms. It provides you with the meals. It provides you with the snacks, you know, all major food groups that are asked for during a mediation. Uh, it also probably most importantly uh, 
keeps you from wearing that hat of a bill collector at the end of the day. As a, as a mediator, you know, you want to be liked. You want to be known as somebody reasonable. You don't want to be known as somebody who will follow you to the ends of the earth to collect the mediation fees. And, you know, being part of a group, that group will have an accounting department where you're not the boogeyman that's chasing, it's the accounting department that's chasing for the fees. And again, by the way, that's another thing that I learned the hard way. You'd be shocked at how many people, even on wonderful settlements, uh, will try to stiff your mediation fee. Uh, so that's, but that's another issue altogether. So believe it or not, we're almost to the end of the program. So if there are any further audience questions, please type those in now. Um, but back to um, our final prepared question. So your book talks a lot about how you've built a mediation practice, you know, effectively conducting the mediation process. But how would your book benefit um, advocates and their clients? How would it benefit the parties to read your book? Well, I will tell you, obviously, this is not the first or the last book uh, that will ever be written with regard to how to become or try to thrive as a mediator. But I wish when I was an advocate in mediations that I had uh, read books such as this one in terms of what is typically going on in the mind of a mediator, because it can only make me a better advocate. Uh, um, and by the way, since I'm no longer mediating, I'm only ar arbitrating now, um, you know, my, my fear would be that if people, you know, w read my book now, I go into a mediation as a mediator and do something and somebody would say, well, Vince, that's, you know, that's on page 27 of your book. Don't try that on me. Um, but I, I do think that that it would it would be very useful to advocates in a mediation. In terms of parties in a mediation, I think it's even more useful to those, uh, especially in the plaintiff's room. And I don't mean to pick on the plaintiffs, but most of the people in the other room, in the defense group, have done this before. They're corporate reps, et cetera, that have done this and have trained for this before. But a lot of times people in a casualty practice in the, in the plaintiff's room have never been in this situation before. They're intimidated as can be. They're fearful. They're angry. They don't know what's going to happen. They think they're going into a courtroom that day. And if they read something, and, and by the way, that's one of the reasons I made the book relatively short. I wanted something that could be read, you know, the night before or a, a day or two before mediation and have them get a roadmap, have them get a feel for what is going to go on mediation day. I would think that, that they would want that security blanket of information to help them through the process. Excellent. So we do have one more audience question, and that sure. is, how do mediators work around parties who are both convinced they will prevail at trial? Uh, summary judgment has already been denied in this example, and each side believes that they have nothing to lose by going to trial because they believe they will prevail on appeal as a matter of law, even if they lose a trial. Well, number one, half the time that's puffing, okay, uh, half, half or more than half the time. That's a nice position to take, um, but again, you, you resort to war stories, you resort to S and M, you know, and and uh, you know, so so you're telling me that you're gonna your lawyer has guaranteed you that you're gonna win this case, and um, if you don't win it, he's not gonna charge you. Is that is is that what you're telling me? Um, and Again, there's no such thing as a certain result by, by again, casually and tactfully probing the uncertainties of any situation, um, you can kind of undercut those situations. I'm not saying that there aren't people who are going to say, you know, we're here because, you know, the judge required us to be here, but 
you know, we're not going to settle this case today because we think the case is worth black dollars. Um, you know, that's happened before, but a lot of the time that's just puffing and it just requires wearing people down a little bit as to the actual facts and as to the ranges and as to the possibilities of what can happen in a courtroom and about how this really is an opportunity to avoid, to avoid worst case scenarios that could happen. Well, Mr. Fornius, we've reached the end of the program. I want to thank you so much for your time. And I want to remind the audience, um, the book we've been discussing, Now You Sue Them, Now You Don't, is available on fastcase.com slash ebooks, as well as on amazon.com. And uh, thanks so much for, for coming to the program. If you want to follow up with any questions or comments, you can do that by emailing support at fastcase.com. Thanks, Mr. Fornius, thank for your you. time. It's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all. Thank you again.